Welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. What follows this is designed to both scare and entertain you. Before we go on, you get one warning. Everything is fair game in horror. Everything. What follows may disturb you. Pseudopod, episode 612, September 14th, 2018. This week's episode, Mafungo Knows by Grady Hendrix, and read by Ant Bacon. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror fiction podcast. This week's going to be so much fun. Uh, we have an incredible story for you from Grady Hendrix, the man whose brain spat forth tales from the White Street Society, and many, many books, including My Best Friend's Exorcism, Horror Store, the Ikea Demonic Possession novel, and most recently, the incredible 80s hair metal riddled We Sold Our Souls. Your reader this week is Ant Bacon, who is, like me, an Englishman and a man of rare vocal talent and wit, who fits this story so well. Thank you both for bringing this aboard. And before I go any further, I would like to read this note from Sean. We at Pseudopod would like to dedicate this story to all of them. Cheetah, Lancelot Link, Mojo Jojo, Monsieur Mala, Bobo the Detective Chimp, Gorilla Grodd, Comrade Dimitri Nine, Cornelius and Zira, Conga, Mighty Joe Young, and all the rest, and most of all, of course, to Kong, whom we all owe an apology to. He must have been a great bloke. It's a true story, folks. Brace yourself. Mafongo Knows by Grady Hendrix, narrated by Ant Bacon. Off the muddy tracks between the House of Shadows, the Freakout, and the Gravitron, where passengers are pummeled with physics until they puke, behind the generators that push power to the top spin, the zipper, and the rainbow back where the night air is so thick you can chew it. Stale cotton candy, old dough fried in rancid oil, the ripe aroma of the IQ Zoo with its pathetic poultry who plink pianos with their beaks. Here, in the jumble of shooting galleries and hoopla trailers, next to the skeetball concessions leaning against the Crystal Lil's refreshment emporium, lies the secret heart of the fair. Mofongo. Gorilla of the Mind. The pulsating brain of the mighty ape is no longer as powerful as it once was, but even its passive presence subtly alters atoms. Read the subconscious signs. Hear the tiny fanfare. For all roads lead to Mofongo. Drop a slice of pizza, and it lands pointing towards his cage. The Wheel of Luck favours its Mofongo side. Lost children are always found in the litter-choked muck outside his tent. On one side, the ten-in-one. On the other, Saddam's spider hole featuring the marine who took down the butcher of Baghdad. In between, Mofongo. Buy a ticket, part the canvas, turn the corner, stare at the cage, see the stage. This is where they come. The scratch and wind junkies, the astrology freaks, the sullen and drunken, the viciously hip, the middle-aged losers with no more illusions, the unwed mothers broken by debt, the credit card crucified, the ghetto schemers, twelve-year-old thug life dreamers, public housing divas, squad car preachers, barroom philosophers, professional television watchers, expert beer can emptiers, bastard baby makers who don't return calls, bail bond skippers, dream destroyers, home wreckers, art school zeros, the angry, the humiliated, the tired, the downtrodden, the hate crazed, and all the unappreciated secret geniuses who will die, still waiting for their big break. They all come here for his wisdom. For he is Mofongo, Gorilla of the Mind. And Mofongo knows. Mummy, the monkey is stinky. 
Mafongo bows his mighty head. Yes, he knows that his jungle musk is too heady for humans. Mummy, the monkey smells like poop. Mafongo's head droops lower. A soul-rattling sigh leaves his massive chest. Ew, mummy, his breath smells like dog do. He's wearing a hat. Yes, this is his power turban, possessing the ability to part the veils of time and peer into the future. A spangled head wrap with an enormous jewel pinning a peacock feather to its centre. He looks dumb and dirty like me more. Tokens rattle. Mafongo sighs and picks up one of the Mafongo nose cards from the table and writes on it with a pen. Then he pushes the card through the slot and into the hand of the adult female, standing with its mate and spawn. The card reads, Mafongo knows that you will overcome all obstacles. This is a bad month for financial decisions. The humans snort in derision. For this, they paid five tokens. For this sad ape with his heavy brow and his matted fur, they used tokens which could have been employed in the pursuit of gravity-defying thrills over at the high-flying swings. This monkey would not get their gratitude. This monkey would get their backs as they walk out the door, mocking him with their high, reedy voices. The young, golden-haired child hangs back from its parents to hurl a final insult at Mafongo, hawking a loogie into its soft throat, expecting to expectorate on the great ape. But Mafongo knows his reach, and with one leathery hand, he seizes the tiny child and lifts it from the floor, pinching off its cry pulling its red, bulging face close to the bars. Human, Mafongo growls. Your days are numbered. I remember your scent. I will come to your home as you sleep and break your bones and drink your blood. I will crush your kidneys. I will split you in half, human, and you will die of pain. Go and tell your friends. Mafongo is coming. He turns his back on the bars. The human child flees. The room is empty. Mafongo adjusts his power turban to better conceal his giant pulsating brain, the enormous thinking engine that has deformed his skull. This overgrown, tumorous organ, swollen to the size of a beach ball, A bottle of beer shatters against the bars of Mofongo's cage, misting his back with glass and beer. You fucking touch a customer! An angry voice slurs. You fucking touch a customer, you jungle fuck! Mofongo tries to use his mind rays to kill Steve Savage, hero of the jungle, but these days his mind rays are weak. Steve Savage is also weak, but Mofongo's mind rays are weaker still. Mofongo tries to kill his old nemesis with contempt instead. Drunk again, he says. How original. Oh, fuck you. Fuck you right between your beady eyes, you fucking hairy fuck, Steve Savage says. What do I tell you? Don't Touch the customers. Don't speak to the customers. Don't take your turban off in front of the customers. You know what would happen if I called the feds. One phone call and they'd fucking incinerate you. They'd fucking cut out your giant fucking brain and put it in a jar. And then they'd stuff you in the trash incinerator and turn it up to 11. And turn you into 700 pounds of ape flavoured ashes. Steve Savage is a man of adventure, and men of adventure age slowly, their lives dragging on long after their actual adventures are over. Together, Mofongo and his ancient enemy are almost 200 years old, 
but neither of them looks a day over 80. Steve sways, filling himself up with Budweiser and rage. This is their fight, one that they used to perform with wondrous weapons that pushed the boundaries of science so far that they shattered. These days, they have nothing left to fight with but paltry profanity. But it's a fight that never ends. Steve Savage, Mofongo says. One day, I will get out of this cage, and on that day, I will rip your head from your puny human body and wash my face in your blood. If you could do that, you would have by now, Steve screams back. I beat your science army! I blew up your danger trees, I fucked up your Femi apes and gibbon gorillas, and I tore off Comrade Carnage's anti-gravity boots and beat the shit out of his commie ass with them. So keep on threatening me, monkey. You didn't defeat the Femi apes, Mofongo yells, jumping up and down, shaking the bars. You didn't defeat them. I saw the photographs. You had sex with them. They were shaved! I had a concussion! Steve Savage screams. You can't prove anything! I can still smell their love musk on you! Mofongo cackles. All these years later, and you still stink of ape sex. Steve Savage climbs on stage and starts kicking the bars of the cage, and Mofongo reaches out and tries to grab his legs. They slap at each other, locked in puny combat, man and gorilla, each with death in his eyes. Then they fall back, panting, gasping, hearts pounding, on the verge of stroke. Steve throws a plastic shopping bag down, just outside the bars. There's your newspapers and your Dutch masters, he says. But no more books until you stop touching the customers. Mofongo's muscles ache so badly that he can barely raise his arms. But with a heroic effort, he manages to get them up and he shoots Steve the bird with both hands. That your IQ or your sperm count, cancer brain? Steve shouts over his shoulder as he leaves the tent. Mofongo opens the plastic bag and his enormous brain twitches painfully with humiliation, anger, rage, hate, death. Steve knows he reads the Wall Street Journal, but inside the bag, beside his pack of natural wrapped cigarellos, is a copy of USA Today. Houseful a got, I? Barry the backwards man says, throwing down his hand. Jesus, Barry, you're making Herman look bad tonight. What are you doing, counting cards? Gretchen the two-ton beauty says. Barry laughs. Lucky naturally, I'm, he says. Everyone knows you can't count cards in poker? Herman the human calculator grouses. Too many variables, not enough data points. Ever what? Barry says. What he said, but vice versa, Gretchen says. You want to play the next round, Mofongo? We'll push the table over. Mofongo presents them with his back. Whole ass and what, Barry says. We come here to keep you company, Herman says. The least you could do is act civil. Buy me a Wall Street Journal, Mofongo says. This is South Carolina, Herman answers. They don't carry the Wall Street Journal? Then give me your copy. I read it online, Herman says. And you know that Steve doesn't want you near a computer. The last time you went near a computer, the space shuttle crashed. I forgot humans stick together, says Mofongo. Oh, come on, none of us thinks you still want to take over the world, Gretchen says. But Steve would freak. Stick a cake in it, Gretchen, Mofongo snarls. This conversation is for superior intellects only. Hey says Gretchen, hurt. Gretchen, personally, it take not do, Barry says. Business brainiac, strictly is this. Us two are they superior, Hal, themselves reminding, keep to have they. One day you will die, 
Mofongo growls. We're dying every day, Fongo, Gretchen says. But it doesn't mean we have to be rude to each other in the meantime. Besides, if you're such a superior intellect, then how come we're all down here and you're up in that cage? Yes. Why is Mofongo up in that cage? The genius gorilla of Ghana, the warrior of Wagadu, the monster who shook the world, a.k.a. Professor Silverback, science ape and eater of Europeans. What is he doing in this cage, in a filthy, stinking, fly-specked, weary, run-down, water-stained, used-up, played-out, cheap jack funfair? Well, bad luck, mostly, and hanging around with the wrong people. When Mafongo sleeps, he dreams of his glorious past, of his first desperate pilgrimage to opera. The hidden jungle city with its wondrous Atlantean geotechnology. His first revolutionary guerrilla army, the piezoelectric death rays. The anti-gravity granite, the neutral enhancers that raised an army of thinking apes who rode anti-gravity platforms down the darker river to crush the British imperialist pigs. The day they burst into the hall at Accra, and turned the Big Seven into the Big Six, the head of Kwame Asante dangling from his hand and dripping onto the expensive carpet. He dreams of his first ape empire, whose borders were drawn in the blood of white men, whose spines he happily ripped out and used to beat their women to death. The lady gorillas. The monkey love. His primate harem. And then the coming of Steve Savage, American adventurer and grade A asshole. At first, Savage was just a jumped up poacher with a flashy public image to peddle. Mafongo should have ignored him. But he didn't, and his attempts to kill the little twerp lent the creep legitimacy. Then over the years, it turned personal. When Mafongo had taken in the refugees of the Third Reich, Savage had been there to destroy his diamond dome. When Mafongo had dug the death mines of Yendi, Savage had appeared, and the ensuing radar war had seen the floating science city of If plunge into Lake Volta, its mathematics burning. The decades were a heady blur of fists connecting with jaws, ray guns melting screaming faces, the ozone tang of jetpack exhaust, the click whir of supercomputers calculating the unsane, the oily stink of robot death squads. It all ended when Mafongo allied himself with the communist freedom fighter Comrade Carnage. Half man, half clockwork terror ruled by an atomic brain. Their dreams of domination died in the nuclear fires unleashed by Steve Savage in his cowardly sneak attack. Mafongo's hoverplane had risen up out of the glowing rubble of his necropalace, another hair's breadth escape, another last-minute dodge that left him at large to go to greater and more grandiose schemes. And then the cold push of Steve Savage's Sten gun against the back of his skull, the poaching bastard having hidden in the co-pilot's seat until Mafongo was distracted. Mafongo knew he should have whipped around with his lightning-fast reflexes and punched Savage in the face, but he was so tired. His limbs were filled with lead, he just couldn't do it. And so, In a split second, Mofongo's days of freedom came to an end. Trapped in a cage, Mofongo travelled with Savage, his parole officer, his warden, his captor, his keeper. He became Savage's meal ticket, the highlight of his roadshow. But the venues got smaller, the crowds got thinner, Savage got older, Mofongo's death rays got weaker. And 25 years ago, they became a single O show. A travelling psychic ape and his owner, floating from one redneck carnival to another, endlessly spinning through the southern east United States, crossing paths and sharing midways with the same bunch of increasingly marginalised attractions 
as the big conglomerates took over the fun fairs, pushing the sideshows further and further to the side. There were a few years, though, where things might have gone differently. Savage had knocked up Nancy the Snake Girl, and they had a daughter. Nancy was a woman of infinite practicality and limited patience for the male ego. She was in love with Steve, however, and gave him eight years to get his life in order and to give up the carny life. When Steve was busy wasting every single one of those years, little Teresa Savage discovered Mofongo. What little girl wouldn't want to listen to a talking gorilla? And what talking gorilla wouldn't welcome a captive audience? And when Teresa went missing and everyone assumed she was hiding near the teacups or gorging on cotton candy, it was Mofongo who used his mental rays to locate her. And it was Mofongo who sent Dog Tag Donald racing over to Bombo's baby show trailer to drag her out in the nick of time. It was Mofongo who identified that the drug in her system was nothing more than vodka. And it was Mofongo who planted a phobic aversion to children under 18 inside Bombo's mind. Not that anyone ever said thank you. Three months later, and the eight years were over, and on the dot, Nancy Savage ditched the carny life without a backwards glance. She didn't even hear Steve's weak protests and pathetic rationalisations. She just picked up Teresa, got her real estate licence, and vanished into an alternative America, where people lived in houses, went to school, and paid their taxes, leaving Steve Savage and Mofongo to return to their interminable bickering and to try and forget the eight-year interruption as best they could. Now, every year, Mofongo gets fewer visitors. And every year, his mental powers fade. And every year, he and Steve find new insults for old injuries. And every year, he smokes his Dutch masters and reads his paper and dreams about revenge until it's an abstraction worn smooth and featureless by constant fantasy. It's been 30 years without a whiff of Teresa Savage, yet here's her smell again, like a golden oldie. We need to talk, she says, standing outside Mofongo's cage with three men in dark suits. Let me guess, Mofongo says, sitting up. He's excited to have some new playmates, especially ones who wear suits. None of his visitors ever wear suits. He hasn't seen a human being in 40 hours. He can mentally dampen his hunger and thirst, but his boredom knows no bounds. He points to them in order. CIA, FBI, NSA. CIA, FBI, and animal control, the youngest says to him. I'm not an animal, Mofongo says. You're not a human either, the man says. Mofongo's nostrils flare. What is this, Teresa? he asks. Why did you come back? Dad's dead, she says. What? He's dead, she repeats. Who did it? A bottle of Southern Comfort and a handful of Vicodin, she says. The day before yesterday. Wrong, Mofongo says. One of his enemies returned for revenge. Mo, I appreciate that you're upset, but this isn't part of you guys' soap opera. He killed himself. No, he says. And he feels fear, because he really does not know who did it. Old allies can turn into new enemies. Old friends can become new foes. Men of adventure are no stranger to psychosis. One of his enemies is here. I may also be in danger. You must free me so I can defend myself. I can't let you come to the funeral, she says, ignoring him. People will want to know why a talking ape is there, and you're kind of hard to explain. 
I don't want to go to his funeral, Mofongo snarls. I want to defend myself. I'm sorry, Teresa says. I really am. On the plus side, we're getting you out of here. Are you setting me free? Mofongo asks, the concept alien to him. There's a primate refuge outside Austin, the animal control man says. They've arranged to take you. You'll fit right in. That chimpanzee who did all those gecko ads, he's there. Chimpanzees. Chimpanzees. Masturbating, shit-flinging, pants-wearing, attention whores. I am Mofongo, gorilla of the mind. I am a threat to mankind. I'm on the UN watch list. You've been off that list for 26 years, the CIA agent says. No one remembers you anymore. If men do not still feel fear, Mofongo snarls. Why do they send the CIA and the FBI? The FBI agent shrugs. I just wanted to see a talking monkey, he says. The CIA agent takes a picture of Mofongo. You're just one more thing on my to-do list, he says. I'm sorry to dump all of this on you at once, Teresa says. I really am. I'll come visit you in Austin. We can catch up. I've got friends. I, I can stay with them and we can just hang out. Like we used to, right? You're making a grave mistake, Mofongo says. I still have my secret science bases hidden throughout your country. You put me in this refugee camp, and I will break out, and I will go to them and manufacture a cloned army of super apes, and together we will grind your country beneath our paws. There are no more secret science bases, the CIA agent says. We got them all back in 51. But uh, what, what if I have one location locked away in my subconscious? Mofongo says. What if it's uh, buried so, so deep down that only my mental rays can find it? What then? Will you risk humanity's future if you are wrong? But Mofongo can't even convince himself. Mofongo, Teresa says. You'll be out in the sun again. You'll be able to live a normal life. I'll check in on you and make sure you have everything you need. I should have snapped your neck when you were a child, Mofongo says. I'm sorry I left you alone for so long, Mo, Teresa says. Then she turns and walks out of the tent with the government men. Don't be sorry, he shouts at her back. Be afraid! Afraid of my wrath! But she's already gone. It takes Mofongo all of the cash hidden inside his power turban to convince Herman to let him out of his cage. If Teresa finds out I did this, I'm dead meat, Herman says. Pathetic, Mofongo spits. The power of a computer in your skull, and yet you tremble like a chimp. The power of a million brains in your skull, and yet a Yale lock has kept you prisoner for thirty-some-odd years, Herman says. I will have my revenge, Mofongo says. Yes, yes, Herman says. I only let you out, because it's cruel to keep you locked up if some old arch-enemies come back to try and bump you off. Mofongo enters Steve Savage's trailer. It's dingy and stained, depressing and undersized with no room to walk around. Mofongo expected wall-to-wall -wall photos, Steve Savage shaking the hands of presidents Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, scrapbooks, posters from the old movies, the radio shows. But there's nothing here except McDonald's wrappers and empty bottles. Mofongo lets his mental rays scan the space. 
They strain to detect a trace of any number of old enemies and allies. The cat, Red Charlie, the beast with 5,000 fingers, Two-Gun Chang and all the rest. Nothing. There's no trace of murder. No hint of death. No whiff of vengeance. No death traps. No man traps. No exotic poisons or mechanical ants. The only psychic residue in this trailer is despondency, despair, and the deep ache of a man who wanted to die long before he got this old. Mofongo's nose begins to bleed, and he feels his headache throb deep within his brain. He wipes the heavy black blood running from his nostrils with the back of one hairy paw. The chair in front of the 13-inch TV is warm to fit Steve's body. Mofongo sniffs it and detects something familiar. He reaches underneath and pulls out a dried leather scrap black with age. Shira's leather headband. Passed down the generations, it was made of the hide of a 30-foot Mukeli Mbombe lizard living on a riverbed near Boyoma Falls. A great beast that had a taste for Oparian flesh. The third blind prince of Opar killed it, fashioned armour from its hide, and 3,000 years later, the final surviving piece was passed to Shira, the most valuable of her possessions. It once commanded the respect of thousands, and now it's lying on the floor of Steve's trailer. Mofongo runs his finger along it, but it crumbles at his touch, and the brittle pieces fall to the linoleum. He and Steve Savage had fought a bitter war over Shira, the jungle empress, each of them in love with the seven-foot warrior queen who ruled the city of Opar. Their battle reduced her city to cinders, and she died in the crossfire. Mofongo hadn't thought about her in years. He always wondered which of them had loved her more. And now he knows. There are only two of us left who remember Shira even existed, he thinks then corrects himself. With Steve gone, now Mofongo is the only one. There are no enemies here, only bad memories. Let them come and put him in the primate refuge. He deserves to be with the bad monkeys now. The chimps will be his new companions, and he'll not speak of revolution or revenge. He'll just pray each day to remember less and less until finally he dies. Transporting a non-human primate over state lines is a complicated business. There are protocols, procedures, shipping container regulations, squeeze box quarantines, OSHA guidelines, permits to be displayed, licenses to be stamped, and the least important thing in all of this is the non-human primate himself. Mofongo sits, not eating, not drinking, staring off into space. You are a giant pain in my ass, the animal control agent says. Seriously, it's a relief to get you out of my hair. He clanks out of the tractor trailer, leaving Mofongo alone. Teresa Savage walks up the metal ramp. Hi, Mo, she says. Mofongo says nothing. I was just with those weird collectors. They're buying the old advertising canvases and one sheets. It's not a lot, but it'll pay for some of this, you know, getting you down to Austin and all. A fly lands on Mofongo's nose. He doesn't notice. I'm glad you're not fighting or anything, Teresa says. Or would you just talk to me? But Mofongo will not talk to anyone anymore. I want you to be happy, she says. I want you to think of this as a vacation. It's not a punishment. It's a time when you can relax, like 
retirement. People look forward to retirement. I, I'm really looking forward to mine. You'll have fun. You'll have a really fun time. Lufongo does not care. It's pretty hot down in Texas, she says. I, I really will come to visit. I want to talk to you about stuff. My dad and things. You were the only person he was close to. The only gorilla, I guess, not really a person. The air is thick and heavy. After we moved, I pretended you could still hear me. I'd lie under my bed and talk to you like you could still hear me through your mind rays or something. You couldn't really hear me though, right? I mean, you never actually heard me, she says. Could you? It's getting hot in the tractor trailer. Mum sold Dog Tag Donald a split level outside Atlanta. He's a born-again Christian now with two little boys and everything, she says. He told me what you did. About the baby show guy? Mofongo will not look at her. You saved my life, Teresa says. All my good memories from when I was a kid are about you. A ten-year-old girl with an iPod jammed in her ears, pink tennis shoes and a denim miniskirt stands at the bottom of the ramp. Mum! She hollers. Are we going? That's Chrissy, Teresa says. My daughter. She yells back. Come up here and meet my fungo. The girl gracelessly tramps into the trailer. It stinks, she says. I didn't even notice, Teresa says. Do you want to talk to her, Mofongo? Say hi to my daughter? There's silence. He used to talk all the time, Teresa says, then thoughtfully. Mostly cussing. Mum, Chrissy says, you're so dumb. He can't talk. He's a monkey. It was a stupid carnival trick. He's a gorilla, Teresa says. Chrissy rolls her eyes. Whatever. Hey, the animal control agent says, standing at the bottom of the ramp. Come and sign these final permits and let's get this show on the road. Teresa turns to go. I'll be right back, she says and leaves Mofongo and Chrissy alone. Chrissy contemplates Mofongo. She goes outside and comes back with a few small rocks. She tosses them at Mofongo. One bounces off his chest, one bounces off his forehead. Then she aims one at his crotch. So, do you talk or anything? she says. Or do you just sit around and smell like shit? She takes a step closer and pings Mofongo on the beaner with another rock. But Mofongo doesn't notice. Because deep within Mofongo's mind, a door has opened and he sees a future where everything Teresa says is true. He will have friends. He will relax. It will be like it was. And he will astonish Teresa's spawn with stories of the marvels he saw in Africa. And Teresa will thank him for helping him raise her daughter, for being an inspiration. And the spirit of Mafongo will live on. Will you come to Austin? He asks, throat rusty with disuse. Chrissy stares at him. Mafongo repeats himself. Will you come? To Austin. Chrissy's high pitched screams bring everyone running, and she crashes into them as she barrels out of the trailer sobbing. Thanks, Mofongo, Teresa says when she comes back a few minutes later, and Mofongo grins. Then he realizes that she's being sarcastic, and his grin fades. You're all signed off, sport, the animal control agent snarls. 
Teresa is jabbing her signature on a final form. Lafongo wants to say something, but he's too confused. Did he do something wrong? He doesn't think so. Teresa marches over to the bars of his cage. What did you say? She snaps. Did you say something gross? I know how you can talk. Did you say something ugly to my little girl? Because she's sitting in my car, crying. Mafongo can't think of an answer. His brain is so sluggish and confused, and the words float the top one at a time, like bubbles in syrup. It takes forever to put them together. Teresa's expression softens. Why do you have to make everything so hard, Mo? She rests one hand on the bars. Why won't you just talk to me? Mufongo wets his lips to say something, but Teresa doesn't notice. She just shakes her head and turns and walks out of the trailer. Men drop the metal ramp with a clang and slam the door shut, and Mufongo speaks too late. Don't go, he says. But no one hears. Flat as a putting green, Arlington National Cemetery stretches out to the horizon, interrupted only by the bone-white dot-dot-dot of headstones. Teresa wishes she could have a glass of wine. A thin, tinny, pre-recorded version of Taps has just finished drilling its way into her skull, and now two pimply soldiers in dress blues are folding the American flag in front of her father's coffin. They march over to her like clockwork dummies and present her with the folded flag. As a representative of the United States Army, one of them chants in a shrill voice that's still breaking, it's my high privilege to present you with this flag. He squeaks on and Teresa remembers how much her dad hated the military. He thought men in uniforms were chumps, and that's why he killed so many of them in the war. He would have died twice if he'd known he'd wind up being buried with so many of them. Teresa uses a Kleenex to blot the sweat off her forehead. A wild scream cuts through the hot noon air. Human blood instinctively freezes in its veins. It's the wild scream of a great ape. And they look up to the sky, hanging by one arm from the robed figure on top of the monument to the Confederate war dead is Mofongo. His head looks bigger than Teresa remembers, as if his brain has turned malignant. His skull looks sick and dark like rotten fruit. Confusion and chatter and Mofongo shoulders some kind of rifle, and one of the clockwork marines dissolves into bones and dust. Everyone screams and scatters as a SWAT team who were waiting for just this kind of incident run forward. They outnumber the mourners two to one. The FBI agent grabs Teresa's arm and drags her behind a round concrete memorial where men in black are doing frantic things. The animal control agent is here. He says... I'm so fired, and lights a cigarette off an eternal flame. I'm holding you personally responsible for this travesty! The CIA agent yells at the animal control agent. I blame you people too! The FBI agent joins in. We've monitored this monster for almost 50 years! We turned him over to you and he busts out of that big rig like it was nothing in less than 72 hours! He used his mind rays, the animal control agent says. We didn't think they still worked. We thought they were supposed to be killing him. Does he look dead to you? Mofongo leaps off the monument to the Confederate war dead and charges Steve Savage's freshly dug grave, tossing aside fleeing mourners like tenpins. The SWAT team sets up a skirmish line. They open fire. They shoot to kill. Their automatic weapons chop the still summer air. Mofongo doesn't slow down. He barrels through them like they're a bunch of crippled children. One of the marines in full dress makes a patriotic last stand. He locks eyes with the charging gorilla. He aims his rifle at Mofongo's overflowing skull and fires. 
the air around Mafongo shimmers and the bullet falls to the ground. Mafongo plucks the rifle from the soldier's hand and bashes him over the head with it. The SWAT team fires again, but the air around Mafongo keeps shimmering and their bullets keep falling. Teresa realises that she's relieved. She thought Mafongo was committing suicide by SWAT, trying to go out in a blaze of glory. But Mafongo is smarter than that. More firing, more shimmering, more bullets fall. What the fuck is that? The CIA agent screams. It's his kinetic suspenders, Teresa says. He invented them a long time ago. I would tell your flamethrower guys not to bother. A flamethrower team is trotting through the headstones. Then they stop and unleash a black and orange column of fire at Mafongo. No effect. Kinetic suspenders, the CIA agent moans. That doesn't even make sense. Where the hell did he get them? The FBI agent asks. We closed down all his stupid science bases. I guess you missed one, Teresa says. Mafongo jumps down into the grave. SWAT snipers take a few more useless shots. A CNN helicopter appears on the horizon, zooming closer. Listen, savage, the CIA agent says. We only gave your old man a plot in Arlington because he shot up a bunch of Nazis back in the day. See that helicopter? That's CNN. America's going to see this desecration of our country's most sacred site live on cable TV. And you will have good, clean children throwing up into their breakfast cereal. It's going to be all your fault. There's a distant sound of something breaking, and pieces of plasticized wood are tossed out of the hole. Suddenly, Mafongo is clambering up from the grave, and in his arms is the corpse of Steve Savage. Holy shit! the FBI agent says. He's taking the body. Will you people show some respect? The CIA agent yells impotently at the CNN helicopter. Teresa just watches. A few more shots ring out. She flinches. Mafongo raises his middle finger at the SWAT team and then touches a control on his chest and a cloaking device clicks off and a hover plane materialises behind him. He lopes over to it, climbs aboard, puts Steve Savage's corpse in the co-pilot's seat and gets in. The ship lifts off. They watch it rise into the air. It hangs there for one unnatural moment, every swooping, graceful curve of its Atom Age engineering, sneering at the 21st century. Then it's gone screaming for the horizon. Which direction is that? shouts the CIA agent. East, the FBI agent says. Towards Africa. Wow, Teresa says. Wow, the CIA agent says. Our nation's most hallowed resting place is vandalised by an obscene baboon and you say wow. Are you sick? Hearing it like that, Teresa wonders if she is sick. Just wanted to protect people from dangerous animals, the animal control agent whines. I'm going to lose my job. What am I going to tell my family? Come on, people, the CIA agent says. Let's find out where they're going and shoot them down. Anyone know where they're going? But no one knows, because suddenly the hover plane vanishes off the radar. Expensive satellites blink in amazement. Where did Mafongo go? No one knows. Tight-lipped, agents of the United States government stuff Teresa into the back of an armoured SUV and question her severely. They want her to know just how angry they are. And so they take turns sitting backwards in the front seat, yelling questions at her. Where did Mafongo go? Why did he steal her father's body? Did Mafongo have any contact with Islamic fundamentalists or with members of Al-Qaeda? What does she know and when did she know it? What can she tell them? She doesn't know anything. She doesn't even know where Mafongo has taken her father. A Viking funeral in Antarctica? A memorial on the moon? 
a secret base buried deep beneath Sahara sands. In a way, it feels more natural to not know where her father is. He was out there, somewhere, the way he'd been out there somewhere all her life. No known phone number, no known address. Maybe in the Himalayas, maybe in a bar. But as long as she never knew for sure, he could be anywhere. She smiles again. And they ask her what's so funny. Why is she smiling? She doesn't answer them. But Mofongo knows. In the hoverplane, Mofongo wipes more blood from his face and feels his ultra brain collapsing into mush. He was still smarter than 5,000 men, but that number was falling fast. His push to escape the tractor trailer, his push to locate his last science base, his push to open its doors. Three pushes too far. Feels like old times, Mofongo says to Steve's dead body. Except I'm not punching you in the face. Then he turns around and punches Steve's corpse in the face. That's better, he says, and smiles. Mofongo flies, finally free. America is behind him, shrinking with every second. And Africa is up ahead, getting bigger all the time. Hello everyone, and welcome to, and I love getting the excuse to say this, a very special Pseudopod NCAP. We're going to do something a little different this week. Instead of the, the usual mildly stentorian Valentine dialesque meditations on the events of the story, uh, we're going to have a conversation. Joining me is Karen Bovenmeyer. Karen is my host, and co-host rather, on our Patreon exclusive show, where once every month or so we get together and do something really nerdy and over and over and analytical. It's great fun. I love it. Karen, hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, Karen has recently joined the Pseudopod team as our, I believe, assistant editor. Is that right? Right. Fantastic. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. And uh, welcome to, I believe, your first Pseudopod NCAP, or have you done a couple before? No, I think this will be my first one. I might have done one when I guest edited Artemis Rising last year, um, but this is my first, like, one participa participant one. Outstanding. So what we're going to do is basically a slightly slimmed down version of what we normally do over on Patreon, which is discuss a cultural thing that's just happened. And in this instance, it's going to be the story you just heard. So, Karen, Mofongo, what do you know? I absolutely adore the role of the daughter in this story. Um, and just how she's portrayed as not just the sympathetic character, like the whole title of the story revolves around her relationship with him. Um, but I like how she has that moment where she's like, what did you say to my daughter? Um, yes. And that portrays her as, as not necessarily sympathetic, which I think lends her a lot more humanity than if she had, you know, stayed the sympathetic one the whole time. I'm so glad you brought that moment up because that is one of the hinges of the story for me because you see her relationship with Mofongo evolve. Um, you see, that almost seems like the cold glass of water to the face for Mofongo as well. The moment where she comes in and he misreads the situation for a second and then realizes he's done something wrong and how all of that leads into him saying, don't go as she leaves and she doesn't hear him or chooses not to hear him. And just the way that the story maps the the evolution in their relationship onto the evolution in ridiculous pulpy tropes that Mofongo embodies is just massively impressive. Yes, I love that combination of the wonderful pulpy tropes, you know, the stench of a robot army and all these these <laughs> things in there that reminded me of old, the old golden age sci-fi that I kind of grew up on, right? But at the same time, this is a very mature conversation about aging and about, you know, death. Um, I had the extreme honor of sitting with a friend 
uh, a few weekends as she died of brain cancer. Um, and she's only in her 60s and we just attended the funeral Friday. But like to be with her as she struggled to still communicate, mm -hmm. to remember, you know, and to see Mofongo, the, the conversation of, yes, we have this ape and he's going to try and go out in this blaze of glory at the end as he's like struggling to remember and struggling to hold on to what's important, which is, you know, punching Steve in the face. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like, you know, that that's such a, pardon, pardon me if I'm going to insult Mofongo here, it's such a human struggle. And I'm glad that that was part of the story as well. Yeah, the Mafungo's struggle to kind of keep control of his life all the way through to the end of it was, I mean, it's possible that we have some listeners right now who are going, that was great, but why was it on Pseudopod? And I mm -hmm. think that is the big reason why for me, that this is a story that deals with massive weighty issues of mortality and personal identity and even how you evolve through culture and how culture changes you and mm -hmm. does so with incredible pathos and incredible lightness of touch with the main character who is a vast psychic gorilla with an exposed brain which is possibly the most Grady Hendrix thing I've ever encountered in my life <laughs> well and truly what is sort of more of a standard trope of horror than the sideshow, the carnival sideshow? Precisely. I mean, been in horror again and again, so much so that an entire season of American Horror Story was set in a carnival. I was just thinking of that, yeah. And it's interesting that you bring AHS up as well, because that's a, as a show, that, that show as a whole is what this very much put me in mind of. Because American Horror Story does that thing where it will have a different premise every single season, and it swings for the fences every single season, and when it lands, it's amazing, and when it doesn't, it's horrendous, as a good chunk of the last year of it was. But this story actually does the same thing in a lot of ways. Like you said, it starts in a carnival. You know, Mafungo is a mostly resigned supervillain. You know... Steve is this, this international man of mystery who lived too long, who won every war. Mm -hmm. And this is a story that, for me, sits in very rarefied air. It's a story that's set after every other story. It's what happens when the stories you tell yourself, the stories you define yourself by, stop. Or change. Yeah. And how you deal with that. And how... I mean, one of my, my favorite lines in this whole thing is, is you know, when Mofongo is giving the human calculator uh, guff about how little he does, and, and that line about, you know, genius level, I, genius level IQ, and you let a Yale log defeat you for 30 years. Yeah, I love that. That was a great line. And it's true. You know, it's... Mofongo settles. Mofongo accepts that this is going to be his life because he enjoys complaining about it, and... If he changes it, then he doesn't have anything to complain about. That's... Yeah, it's like, you know, the world of super battles he knew was ending and was over. And so his choice was, you know, what am I, am I going to be emperor of this, of this place um, and just kind of hang out? Or am I going to go with this guy that I've battled all this time? Because he's the most stimulating and interesting thing that has ever happened to me. <laughs> so I'm going to go and live in these terrible conditions for a really long time because this guy is, is really stimulating and interesting to me and reminds me of who I used to be. Versus, you know, like, these are the choices Mafango makes. He makes the hard choices. He makes the, the uncomfortable choices. Because he could, you know, like, the girl offers him, hey... You could go to this place and he even spends a moment imagining it like oh i could have friends i could have a peaceful life mafango's never wanted a peaceful no. life and I, I, again you know you 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 kind of reminded me of one of my other favorite points which was the first con confrontation between mafango and steve where they have that just pathetic fight where they're, they're kind of flapping at one another from each side of the bars and it's hilarious 
and at the same time heartbreaking because these are two old men who or an old man and an old hyper evolved simian who both haven't let go of who they yeah. used to be and they find a deep joy in that slap, slap fight you know yes and they find joy in swearing at each other yeah it, it's like that their relationship is a joke that only they get you know <laughs> yeah. it, it just that there is tremendous affection behind the venom and i mean again grady is one of the very few authors on earth who can make the end of a story being you know his evil main character punching a corpse in the face kind of sweet but he does <laughs> he, he manages it it's true but no I, I i really i really really like this i mean grady has never turned in any material i've i've read that i haven't gone Oh my god, I love his brain, uh, and this is this is no exception. But it also it does such a wonderful job of taking this thing which is prevalent in comics culture a lot at the moment, and to a lesser extent in genre fiction as a whole. Of you know, I I call it quickly to the past, where you know you hide this desire for things to be simpler inside a willful turning away from how things are now. And, I mean, you can see it in the endless re recycling of certain ideas. You can see it in the overt fondness for pulp. You can see it in a lot of the really tiresome splinter groups that are making a lot of noise in a couple of different theatres. And Grady engages with that here and does so with dignity and honesty and perception and uses the past as a means of Morfungo in particular making peace with his future, what little of it is left and does so in a way that's brave and horrible and petty and stupid and kind all at once and i'm going to be thinking about that for a long time for me one of the essences of horror is the choice a character makes during the story i mean you know as alan datlow has said horror is, is really kind of a mood but for me it's also related to choice and the choice that Mafango makes that I think makes this horror is he decides to reject the peaceful life you know where he could pass on his knowledge and learning to the next generation right Teresa's daughter um, he, he chooses instead <laughs> the, the other choice the darker choice um, you know which is, I'm gonna steal this body. <laughs> and, exactly. You know, break crap because that's who I am. And, but, you know, there, there's that. And, and, and wrapped around that as well is that, again, just gleaming little moment in, in the story when the body is stolen and, you know, the government agents are all running off to try and pursue him. And, and Steve's daughter is just standing there smiling. Mm hmm. She's like, well, and she had just finished telling us that, that her father would have hated being buried there. So, you know, he kind of gets out of that desecration of the dead yeah. <laughs> problem. <laughs> and, and just how this is kind at the same time as petty and vindictive and horrible and sweet. And I just, it, it, it's ground that Grady spends a lot of time in, but I don't think he's done it better in a long time than he, than he does it here. Okay. Just, I, I, I loved this. I, I thought that, that this was an absolutely fantastic piece of work, and you know, I, I for one welcome our psychically enhanced, imminently dead gorilla overlords. You know. <laughs> yes, I want the all hail the return of Shiara, the seven foot warrior queen. Ah, uh, just yeah, that that is a prequel that has to happen, and. <laughs> Ideally, if said prequel can also in include details of how the White Street Society interacted with them, so much the better. Mm -hmm. So, that about covers things for me. Do you have any wrap-ups, Karen? I don't think so. I love this story, and I hope you all loved it too. And if you'd like to talk with us more about it, please visit our forums. Like my learned and esteemed colleague said. And also, um, as I will no doubt be talking to you about in a couple of minutes in the donation call, if you want to hear Karen and I talk about stuff like this from anthropological and cultural viewpoints at the same time, combining to 
create a colossal intellectual Voltron of enthusiasm. This is exactly what we do every four to five weeks or so over on the Patreon feed. And we do it for a longer period of time, and it's great fun. I, re- I really enjoy doing this. and oh, thank, ho- you. thank you. And hopefully um, some of you will sign up and hear us being enthusiastic. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you, Al. And now, over to me. We rely on you to pay our authors, cover our server costs, and ensure that Big Vinny only ever takes our fingernails rather than our fingers. I am, of course, kidding. He never does that. At least not anymore. I'm not kidding about relying on you, though. There are three ways that you can help out. The first two involve money, and they also involve the letter P. You can donate or subscribe through Patreon or PayPal. Five bucks subscription at each level gets you access to our premium content bucket, which is literally a bucket. Shortly, it may even graduate towards being a VAT. It is so full of free extra audio content. So, if you want to help out, you want some extra stuff in return, subscribe at that level and you'll get it. Or, donate as much or as little as you want, or subscribe at a higher level on the Patreon and get all kinds of other fun stuff too. If you can't do that, and it's fine if you can't, then please consider helping raise our profile a little bit. Leave a review on iTunes or Google. Um, Request us at Spotify. If you have a blog and you want to talk to us, get in touch. If you want to link to an episode on Twitter, please do. It's all good, and it all helps. And we appreciate everyone who pitches in. We'll be back next week. Then, as now, we will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. And we leave you with this quote from League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I thought as much, Miss Murray. Though I am a beast, do not think that I am stupid. I know that I am hideous and hateful. I am not loved, nor ever hope to be. Nor am I fool enough to think that what I feel for you is love, but in this world alone... I do not hate you, and alone in this world, you do not hate me. See you next week, folks. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.